boys and girls, thank you for joining us once again this evening, my time, early this morning, uh, Rachel's time. Of course, you're also welcome if you're not a boy or a girl, you might be an attack helicopter, you might be a pine tree or a, a Lego train, who are we to say otherwise? Frankly, however you identify is perfectly okay with us, isn't it, Ted? Ted agrees. Ted identifies as a giant in the entertainment industry and his pronouns are fee fi fo and fum uh, that's enough from ted for one day let's introduce our guest of honor for today today's guest is dr rachel brown a psychiatrist who also has the um dubious pleasure i suppose of being a, a shared friend of dr sarah pew and kind of that's how we came into contact um you have a book out you have a book out rachel tell us all about it I do, yeah. Um, actually, I published last July, so July 2022, um, and the book's called Metabolic Madness. Um, I self-published. It's on Amazon in in kind of digital and uh, paperback form. Um, and I wrote it really just because I, I work in a crisis service in the NHS, so I tend to have fairly limited contact with, with people. So I tend to only see people over a few weeks at the most. Occasionally, we get people for longer. Um, but I just really wanted an opportunity to be able to put in writing everything that I really want to tell people in relation to their metabolic health and how it impacts on mental health. But I rarely have the opportunity to do so in my clinical job. All right. So that's, that's why I wrote that. Brilliant. So how does metabolic health impact mental health? What are the connections? What are the threads? Without giving away the whole book, you know, but uh, give, us, give us the flavor of that. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I always say I think there are so many different connections because I I've grown increasingly frustrated in in Western medicine or allopathic medicine in, in terms of the silos that the different medical specialties get placed in. And um, I went through all of my psychiatric training, really placing a lot of emphasis on genetics and family history and um, people's personal life experiences and adverse childhood events and, and those types of issues, trauma in the background. But actually, I think when you look at the science these days, there's a lot to suggest that metabolic health is absolutely crucial for mental health. And so I, I've, I've, I've trained in functional medicine in the last couple of years, and that also piqued my interest, particularly in terms of gut health um, and trying to look at the root cause, because I don't think that we necessarily do that all that well in, in allopathic medicine. So it tends to be a what medication can you prescribe? What diagnosis do you make? And what psychological therapy do you prescribe or other, other multidisciplinary intervention that you get into without necessarily thinking what's happening at a cellular level in the body and what's happening in terms of your metabolism and your brain energy. Uh, so lots of different systems involved. Um, I always start with the gut because I think gut health is absolutely key. Um, but I also think that the state of the research in terms of gut health is in its infancy. So I think there's so much that we just don't know yet about the microbiome. Um, however, we do know that leaky gut or increased intestinal inflammation leads to uh, systemic effects throughout the body. Um, when you open up the tight junctions in your intestinal cell wall, then you can have leakage of toxins and other irritants into the bloodstream that then spark off a whole immune system reaction. Um, I was watching an interesting podcast by Dr. Paul Mason yesterday, one from a few years ago that I hadn't actually watched until very recently, um, and it was all about lectins. Uh, so even just within that podcast, our lecture, he was talking about um, the evidence for lectins traveling up the vagus nerve into the brain. Um, and, and quoting different figures in terms of studies and, and the relationship between lectins and the risk of Parkinson's disease. So that's just one example of what can happen in terms of the foods that you consume and the, the further systemic effects that that can have in the body, particularly in relation to inflammation in the brain. Um, I feel a bit on shaky ground when I mention mitochondria around you, I must admit. <laughs> I don't ah, please, wrong. please. I won't bite, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, mitochondrial health is absolutely key as well for, for mental health and, and also involved in the immune system response and the inflammatory response in the body and oxidative stress is a huge one. 
Um, and we know that high carbohydrate diet, um, you know, leads to mitochondrial dysfunction and an imbalance between your reactive oxygen species and your, your endogenous antioxidant. And then you run into difficulties with brain metabolism in terms of having sluggish glucose metabolism in the brain over time, particularly if you have difficulties in relation to insulin resistance um, at the blood brain barrier. So they're, they're all, there are many different pieces to the puzzle. Um, that's sure. a quick, a quick uh, rattle through some of the, some of the main issues. Brilliant. So the best diet you think at large as a sweeping generalization for most people in terms of mental health would be what? Um, so I would say a low carbohydrate diet. I, I am particular fond of ketogenic diet because I think the science and there is ongoing research. I've had some involvement in a pilot study um, based at the University of Edinburgh that we've just finished completing completing that and we're in the process of analysing the data. But um, there's going to be a lot of research in the in the next year or two. I would say. Um, particularly in terms of clinical trials of ketogenic diets for major mental disorder. Um, I trained with Dr. Georgia Eid um, two years ago now, so it was January 2021. So she's really, she really spiked my passion to, to try to promote this further and to really try to promote the field of metabolic psychiatry and more lifestyle interventions for mental disorders. Um, however, you know, I, I'm particularly fond of the carnivore diet myself, so I, I, I do wonder whether in the future um, there's going to be further evidence that actually having, having it, well, some may consider a more extreme form of a ketogenic diet being a carnivore diet, but I do suspect that there are benefits in relation to carnivore and relations in terms of mental health, even when people necessarily haven't seen the improvements they wanted to see, even with a ketogenic diet. So I think what I'm trying to say is a lot of the evidence now points towards a ketogenic diet because of the unique aspects of ketone bodies in terms of reducing inflammation and reducing the inflammatory and immune response in the body. And But I do know, and I'm in contact with quite a number of people where a ketogenic diet didn't necessarily improve their mental health to the point they wanted to, to be, um, but, but they've, all, they've gone on to have a lot of success with a carnivore diet. So I'd really love for that to be researched further um, in the future. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so tell us about this fondness that you have for, you know, for yourself in terms of the carnivore diet. What's your experience there? How did you come to it or whatever diet is? First of all, tell us what your diet is. I shouldn't preempt. And tell us, you know, how you came across that, how you came to form that, that dietary habit, I guess, or lifestyle. And what your experiences have been wide ranging up on your hind legs basically tell us tell us all okay okay i'll do my best so um yeah i've been carnivore about three and a half years now and i just stumbled a across it um so kind of going back a bit further i first got into low carb it was probably around the year 2000 so it's when atkins came out and was all the rage um, and I remember an uncle of mine had come over from America to visit and, and he was the first person who mentioned to me about Atkins and it was just something I hadn't really heard of before and I bought the book and then delved into all of that and off I went. Um, but I, I, I hadn't realised over all of those years that intervened that I had a major sugar addiction um, and that's something that carnivores really highlighted to me. So probably about six or seven years ago I'd been low carb for 10, 11 years consistently but not necessarily to the extent of being ketogenic. And um, there was some illness in my family in terms of neuro neurodegenerative disorders. And I, I decided it was time to commit to doing a proper ketogenic diet. Um, so I went properly keto six or seven years ago now. And it was just a keto influencer. I, I don't like that term influencer, but it was uh, Vanessa Spina, our ketogenic girl, um, whose work I really admire. And I, I really enjoyed some of her meal plans that she published and some of the content she puts on her podcast. I find it really interesting. So I really respected her view. Um, and she happened to post that she was doing a carnivore diet trial. And that's how I first heard of carnivore. When I first heard of it, I thought, what on earth is she, <laughs> what on earth is she doing? That's absolutely crazy. Um, but then I watched Michaela Peterson speak at CarnivoryCon on YouTube and heard, heard her whole health journey. And then I listened to Sean Baker 
also speak about how broken the state of nutritional research is. Um, and that was me sold. And I, I, I decided to try it purely out of curiosity because I, at the time I didn't think I had any major health problems. You know, I was, I was kind of just getting along, um, not really complaining of anything major health wise. Um, but carnivore has been this eye opening for me, um, particularly in relation to satiety um, and being able to fast much more easily and just having a much better relationship with food. So when I look back, even when I was keto, there were certain foods that were still a bit problematic for me, such as very dark chocolate or nut butter. So some foods that would feel a bit more compulsive or I would end up snacking on in the evenings. And in retrospect, I don't really know if I probably could have been including more red meat and having a much meat heavier ketogenic version of the diet that I was doing. Um, but, but actually carnivore has just completely revolutionized my relationship with food um, and, and also my body image, I would say. So, so yeah, I've had, I've had benefits in terms of body recomposition and strength when I do strength training and um, that zero carbs then that people talk about. So some improvements just in terms of mood and a sense of well-being, not that I was necessarily struggling with major mood issues, but but there's just something I can't quite put my finger on. Um, but there have been so many benefits. Um, and also my immune health has been a lot better. So I used to constantly be coming down with different colds and sinusitis intermittently. And, and that really has been 90% better overall than, than it had been for quite a number of years. So basically so many benefits. I just haven't looked back. And, um, and it also has changed my... My taste buds, definitely in terms of sweet things. So every so often, um, I've got a 10 year old son and if we've been out somewhere and he happens to get ice cream or, or something for dessert and doesn't finish it, I've thought just out of curiosity, should I try a spoonful of that and just see, see what it's like? And it's absolutely abhorrent to me, the taste of, <laughs> the taste of sugar these days. So that's been really interesting. Yeah. Amazing. What? On earth, and, and it's not supposed to be a rude question at all, but what on earth led you into psychiatry? Where where did so, that come from? Do you know, I don't really know. So I, I obviously went to medical school, um, and that was from school. So I graduated from medicine at the age of 22, which looking back is really, really young. Um, but just mm. in Scotland, you know, I kind of went to university at 17, just turning 18. And that was just, that's just what happened, tends to happen here, depending on your birthday falls. Um, but I, I always felt that I wanted to do psychiatry, but I didn't really know why. So I didn't have any direct personal experience of, um, you know, like a close relative having a major mental illness or even mental health problems, particularly. Although admittedly looking... <laughs> Working in psychiatry for many years, um, it is a bit easier to pick out some issues that you may not have noticed <laughs> previously when you look at friends or family. Um, but I don't know, I just, I just had a sense that that was my purpose and what I should do. And I, I remember I didn't particularly enjoy much else at university, apart from orthopaedic surgery, bizarrely. But I think that was because I'm quite practical and I like the engineering side of that and, and, and the you know, logical things. Um, but I never wanted to go through surgical training and it, it was always psychiatry that I was interested in. I don't think I really knew what it was in, until I was a student in psychiatry because I remember doing my clinical placement and thinking, oh, this isn't exactly what I was expecting. Um, but essentially just I'm interested in people and what motivates people and, and um, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely what I was meant to do. But having said that, having worked for quite a number of years now, I went into psychiatry in 2004. Um, I've just become disillusioned uh, by the by the approach. And I've always had a more of a holistic health, lifestyle health type interest. Um, and that's creeping more and more to the forefront now, um, certainly. Mm. Yeah, I mean, as I say, it was was not at all a rude question, and and I wasn't trying to lead you anywhere in particular, except that I I happen to know because we were chatting a little bit just before we started recording that you you're still um, an employee of His Majesty's NHS, 
Um, yeah. And I do have quite some understanding of the inside workings of, of that. And it's not just the NHS, by the way. It's, it's the same sort of thing here in New Zealand. I could tell you some stories from my trip mm-hmm. to the ED or the ER, if you like, um, the other day that would set you here on end as well. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the thing is about these, these um, organisations is that actually people, the needs of people, doesn't seem to actually be very high on the list. It's, you know, payment by outcomes rather than, mm-hmm. you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I know I'm. I know I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to get you in any trouble or ask you to say anything to get yourself in trouble. But yeah, I'm just kind of acknowledging yeah, that. Yeah, I don't disagree. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, the other for those that want to know the the inside scoop I've got on the NHS is that um, I used to be married to a person who works at a very high level in the NHS, actually in forensic mental health, if you, if you want to know. Okay. Um, her, her, her job is in, well, she describes her job as stopping psychiatrists from killing the patients. Because, <laughs> okay. um, you know, making sure that the, the prescriptions are sound. Drug and, errors. And, 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 yeah. Yeah, drug errors and, and catching those and, and dealing with, you know, the patient that says they don't want to be on this particular drug anymore and, and her going, yeah, well, when you're off it, you're a little bit stabby. You know, can you see this kind of thing? Yeah. So, yeah. All right, interesting times in the NHS, interesting times um, in all parts of the world, really. Mm-hmm. So where do we go? Worry, go on. Yeah, I was just going to say I worry a bit about... Um about the treatments that we give people, particularly some of the more modern antipsychotic medicines and their tendency to cause insulin resistance and yes. metabolic dysfunction in them in themselves. And yeah, so I, I just I have lots of ethical concerns. I I also did a I have a master in medical laws and ethics, which I did along the way in, in my kind of when I was a higher trainee in psychiatry and so I have an interest in medical ethics as well. So I think that's probably an angle that comes in here too. So, so yeah, quite a few conflicts. Yeah, because, I mean, very much within that allopathic pathway, very much paint by numbers, very much, you know, stay inside the lines, the tools that you would have available to you are limited. They are on a list of, you know, you can use this for that and that for the other thing. Here are the, here are the licenses and things. And obviously you can't think for yourself. You can't deal with what's in front of you with any degree of creativity at all because you're going to get struck off, aren't you, if you step out of the lines? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so um, I, yeah, from what I've seen of other colleagues and myself, I, I am acutely aware that at the, at the practicing psychiatrist, we're, we're all open to criticism, particularly from our regulator. Um, and yeah, I don't want to be too pessimistic about it, but I, I suspect it's not pessimism. I suspect it's more realism that, that you could be doing as good a job as, 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 the, as the next person and still run into a lot of criticism, just, just even you know, about what medication you prescribe or why didn't you do this or why did you not prescribe that treatment for somebody or why did you make that diagnosis? It should have been a different diagnosis. And then there's so much subjectivity um, in the field of psychiatry as well that, that uh, yeah, it's not necessarily an easy place to exist as a professional. All right. So where do you see your future Right, so what, where do you go from here? Do you stay in psychiatry? Do you branch out from there? And perhaps you could go back to orthopedics and then you could come and re-engineer this, this tendon what I bushed. <laughs> yeah, I think you'd be better off consulting somebody else for that, if I'm honest. Oh, perhaps I'll go and see Sean Baker. He's, he's an orthopedic surgeon, or he was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. he'll do. I'm sure he would do a good job. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it, there's some exciting things happening in in the field of metabolic psychiatry or an emerging field of more nutritional or metabolic psychiatry so I'd really like to be involved in advancing that 
Um, so there'll be ongoing research in the next year or two and just trying to be more of a public voice to get the message out to people that what they eat and the choices that they make in terms of their lifestyle can make all the difference in terms of their mental health. Um, whether I, you know, I, I would love to establish some sort of service within the NHS, although albeit you, you'll you still be restricted. But I think even if you were practicing out with the NHS, you'd still be restricted by the regulators. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Things are up in the air. So I'd really like to develop something in the NHS so that people have an option that, that is different to just the standard that's on offer these days. But if it ends up, I have to move more into private practice or more down a functional health route, then that might be a possibility as well. Mm. Well, I mean, again, making assumptions, you, you appear to be, you know, young enough to have that um, ability to, to change direction and, and do something different. I'm not suggesting you absolutely should by any means. I mean, the, the NHS is a, is a fine profession if, if you can survive in that world. Um, yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting stuff. All right. So, with all of that being said, um, final words of wisdom, uh, ideas that you want to share, things that people need to get a handle on in terms of what do they need to understand going forward about you know mental health and its connection to diet and the gut and and all of that. Give us a bit of a bit more on that, I guess. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I essentially think of mental health disorders as inflammatory disorders of the brain. Um, there's a lot of evidence to show there's raised inflammatory markers, and, and, you know, when somebody's experiencing either an acute or even sometimes a chronic mental health disorder. Um, yeah, gut health, I, I mentioned earlier, um, it, it's just, it's hard to get across to people just how vital what they choose to put in their mouth is because. We're living in a time where the nutritional guidelines and the pyramids and so on have been pushing a very carbohydrate heavy, um, seed oil filled diet, um, all of which, the, you know, all of those foods are inherently inflammatory in the body. And, and there's, there's a lot um, in the way of evidence in terms of trends of morbidity data, so rates of type 2 diabetes and obesity. Um, if you look at the graphs there, all of that has just skyrocketed and continues to, um, as do mental health disorders. Um, so it just seems to fit. And I'm not a huge fan of epidemiology, but from, a, from that point of view, the trends do seem to go in that direction. And um, I think people really just underestimate the, the impact that their choices can have in terms of optimizing their mental health. So. I see lots and lots of people in my day job who actively want a prescription for something, but they don't necessarily think about what they can do to to better their situation. And that's really incredibly frustrating. Um, and the other frustrating part is that I don't think my profession as a whole is necessarily aware of the of the data that's out there now and the research to to that strongly suggests that mental health disorders do relate closely to metabolism in the body and that there there are lifestyle factors that can that can change somebody's health outcome and and the genetics thing that i mentioned at the beginning i've moved very much on to epigenetics so, so that sense that the lifestyle choices we make can affect our gene expression in our body and our risk of developing illness and the risk of living with chronic symptoms versus actually being able to resolve your symptoms. So I just really want to put out a message of hope that there's a lot that people can do. And I'm really encouraged by the by the advancing field of metabolic psychiatry, because I, I know from practitioners like Dr. Georgia E, that she has great results within her client group and, and patients who improve to the point of remission, whereas previously when she was practicing within a more mainstream paradigm, um, it would just be symptomatic relief, essentially, that you would be doing in terms of the medication and the psychotherapy. But I think a combined approach for many people uh, will yield much better results. And for some people, even, they might be able to treat themselves naturally without um, taking what are quite significant medications for a long, a long period of time. Because we know that people end up on these medications for years, sometimes decades. 
um, in many cases, and no medication comes without side effects. Um, so, so yeah, those are all yeah. my concerns. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a really, really excellent point around the epigenetics side of thing, and I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand that. Just because you might have a certain gene in your gene makeup, that doesn't mean that you're going to experience the result of that gene fait accompli. Tell us a little bit more about how genes are not something that just produce a protein and they do that all the time and you're going to get that outcome. Um, give us a bit of a rundown on that. Oh, I don't know if you you'll be better placed. I feel like I'm going to say something that might be wrong here, but um... and then I'll have to make a video about you. Who was wrong on the interwebs? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I wouldn't dare. I wouldn't dare because Sarah yeah. would be after me, wouldn't she? Very quickly. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe we'll use that one. Mm. Um, um, I don't know that I can give a comprehensive overview, but I my brain tends to work on basic principles. So when I read the research, and that's part of the reason I wrote the book was so that I was able to summarize and make notes for myself to refer back to, but I tend to take away basic principles. And um, I've been a big fan of Mark Sisson's work for many years, um, so from Mark's Daily Apple and the whole ancestral health perspective. And I think it was probably Mark Sisson who first turned me on to the idea of epigenetics and, and the fact that our, our genes do not determine our destiny because your environment and and yeah, it's not just genes, it's a lot of it's about environment and the choices that you make. And um, so you can switch on and switch off certain genes. I know that the mitochondria come into that as well. Um, I'm not sure that I'm well placed off the top of my head to give you a very accurate description, though, of just exactly the mechanisms um, by which that happens. No, no, that's that's absolutely fine. I was just looking for the for the confirmation from you, which you've just given quite eloquently, I thought, mm -hmm. that a gene one gene, what any one gene will do is it will make any one given protein that it encodes for. That's all a gene will do, nothing else. It makes that protein, but that gene can also be told to not make that protein. And that de that's determined by messages that the genes receive, um, which are impacted by the environment in which those genes are placed. So... For example, you might have a gene set that would lead you very strongly to a much higher likelihood of, for example, type 2 diabetes, obesogenesis, those kind of issues. And yet, you might be fit, strong, muscular, you know, slim and lithe, despite the, the entirety of that gene set, if you place those genes in the right environment, i.e. you treat yourself right. And I genuinely believe the same is true with regard to mental health conditions. Any, yeah. you know, there's no difference, I don't think, with mental health issues and many other health issues, even including the underpinning etiology, which I think you've also mm -hmm. mentioned already, and that is inflammation. Yeah. You know, 90 something yeah, I mean, percent of the time. Yeah, yeah, in the process of writing what I wrote and just going through all the the research and trying to make all the connections for myself, for my own understanding, it has completely revolutionized my view on mental disorders. And that's that's coming from somebody who's been practicing psychiatry um, for quite a number of years now. And it's really exciting because it's just opened up a whole new realm of possibility in, in terms of how you actually approach people who come in 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 a in a state of mental distress and um yeah i'm just very encouraged by it all because i i absolutely agree with you i i don't look at mental disorders as any different to any other physical health disorder it just it just happens to be manifesting um with a slightly different pattern of symptoms more behavioral type symptoms or or mood or whatever you want to classify it as um but i i would i would be really hopeful that that trying to get this knowledge out there and to let people understand that there are underlying there's a clear underlying physical health basis to mental health disorders um that that would hope that 
that would hopefully take away some of the stigma that so many people have to deal with when it comes to mental health, because ultimately I don't view it as any different to any other disorder in the body. Um, and I happen to be interested in metabolism and and um, risk of heart disease and obesity and type 2 diabetes and so on. So it's just even better that it happens to all fit together with that as well. Excellent. Our modern, our modern day diseases, as they say. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Outstanding. Um, this half an hour cut out with no difficulty whatsoever, um, as, as I knew there would be. I could talk to you all day, of course. Um, Because I think it's a really fascinating area. I do thank you very, very much, Dr. Rachel Brown, psychiatrist. Tell us again the title of your book. It's called Metabolic Madness. Metabolic Madness by Dr. Rachel Brown. And you can get that on Amazon, apparently. Yes, excellent. Get uh, No, not at all. Get get, Get hold of your copy, boys and girls. Those are your orders, my meat militia. Um, Snap to and all that and salute and go and get that happening. Um, do you do social media in that? I presume not as an NHS current employee that you, you're not doing that kind of craziness. Well, I am actually. Oh and, wow, um, good. Tell us I'm about on it. Instagram it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, what can I say? I'm a, a bit rebellious at heart, so um, I'm on Instagram as Carnivore Shrink. That's my name on Instagram, and there are various links in my profile to my website and so on. Awesome. Very good. All right, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wind up there. As I say, thank you very much for your, for your valuable time this morning, your time, this evening, my time, and um, we'll catch Thanks. up with you around the traps. So um, just before we do go off, though, I, like I heard from a little bird whose name is Dr. Sarah Pugh. So there you go. That's the little bird. <laughs> that she suggested yep. to you that you do an interview with me and your immediate reaction was like, ooh, ooh, not sure about that. <laughs> tell, just tell us that story before we go. Yeah, so um, it was probably, were we messaging on Instagram? It might have been. It was definitely a written form of message and um, she suggested you and I think my instant reply was, oh, he's a bit intimidating. And I probably put an emoji in in there. And then she replied saying, oh, he's actually a really, really nice person. That's that's a bit of a character for for his YouTube channel. And I said, oh, okay. So I I kind of, I trust her opinion on things. Um, But it made me laugh when when she was on your recent podcast and then you, you were talking about that because that, that was just a very bizarre experience for me because I, I was kind of winding down in the evening, just watching the podcast, enjoying, just listening along. And then suddenly my name came up and she mentioned that, that I thought you were intimidating. So that's mm. that story. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really. I'm not really. But that hasn't been yeah. my experience today. <laughs> No, good. All right. I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that it wasn't too wasn't too uh, intimidating and all of that. And um, look, it's it's been an av- absolute privilege and pleasure to have you. Some very very interesting perspectives on an area that I think really definitely needs a lot more research, frankly, because it really is very very important. Most of the current allopathic uh, treatment methodologies for mental health issues are appalling chemical shitstorms that really do more damage than good long term and may control symptomology, I find. This is my just my personal opinion, but at the expense of long term health. So what's the point? Um it seems to be a band-aid approach when we really, really need something a bit more holistic, a bit more curative, a bit more supportive. But anyway, I'll I'll say that and and we'll leave it at that. As I say, once again, a pleasure. Okay. All right. Catch you next time, boys and girls. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Not at all.